phone, and then say your name and press the during the call. Please press star six at any time. Time zone. Should I check in again? Yeah, Rob, Rob? Yeah. Rob Menzies from Denver Public Schools. Good to hear your voice, sir. Anybody Thanks, else? Jessica Anderson from Salt Lake City, Utah. Excellent. Clint Stevens from Cedar City, Utah. You know Paul Larson down there at uh, Southern University of Utah? I don't. Okay, no problem. Anybody else from Mountain Time Zone? Okay, how about the Pacific Time Zone? Is that a woman on? That's a good Well, Veronica, we'll have to uh, Arcadia, California. Hi, Veronica. Hi, from Los Angeles County, sorry. <laughs> For those that don't know where Arcadia is. And anybody else, uh, Pacific Time Zone? And uh, any other time zones or anybody we missed that came on after we started doing the roll call? Well, Diana Warren is here from the Hawaii Time Zone. Well, very cool. <laughs> Aloha. Hey, Aloha, Diana. <laughs> Anybody else that we missed? Now, this is Robert Earl. I was with the Utah State Office of Education volunteer. Hi, Robert Earl. Uh, where, what, what county are you in? Are you in Utah County, Salt Lake County? No, I'm in Salt Lake. Okay. Try to right now. <laughs> so I joined the joined the conference. <laughs> All right, folks. Well, great to have you here. Joseph Kursky and Esther Worker here in Denver, uh, your hosts. What we want to do here is, as hopefully you can see on this slide, discuss using public domain spatial data portals in GIS-based research and education. Now that's kind of a tall order for the 50 or so odd minutes we have together. And so one of the things I wanted to stress right at the beginning is you can't learn access, <laughs> formats, uh, how to download every single data set out there in, in an hour, okay? But hopefully this will give you some confidence that, yes, there is a boatload of spatial data out there and give you a concrete example in a, in a real lesson on how to grab specific data sets for uh, analysis and how you might be able to teach with that, okay? This is your workshop. We want it to be valuable for you all. So we'll have questions and answers at the end. Um, we'll also have Esther here as having having the ability to respond to your questions that you type in. So again, make this uh, useful for you all. So what I'd like to do is to discuss some of the spatial data types that are out there, base spatial data, not every single data set in the world. I think many of you are like me, you're in a GIS workshop and then there was a point in history where you all of a sudden realized, oh gosh, the internet is my spatial data library. <laughs> and then you said to yourself, oh, that means I can download watersheds and aerial photos and satellite imagery and soil data and earthquake and other hazard data, populations, cities, and all the rest of it. Yes, and we're not going to go through every single one of those data sets. However, we are going to discuss some main base spatial data types. We're also going to briefly talk about how to download, format, and use some of those data types for use in a GIS with emphasis on ArcGIS 9. We're going to then walk through a lesson that uses a variety of these data portals, uh, private companies, state portals, and national portals to analyze a problem, and that is hurricane assessment and testing. Remember, this is just an example. Uh, many of these data sets you can use for other kinds of lessons. Also, what we might do at some point uh, in a future webinar is we could highlight data portals that we didn't cover today, and also we could all, uh, do a a webinar on local data portals because there are many cities and counties, as you're probably aware, that have GIS data portals. 
they, they are not as common as in terms of free and open access as state and national and some international data portals, but they are nevertheless out there and uh, many of them are quite useful. So we might do that uh, at some point in the future. I'll talk to Esther about setting something like that up if there's interest. Okay. Uh, just want to let you folks know that on our ARC Lessons data library and uh, uh, lesson library, this presentation will reside. Give me 48 hours or so to get that up there. I wanted to make some final tweaks right before our webinar, so it's not up there right now. Um, and also, I wanted to reserve the, uh, uh, the, the win little window of time to get your comments uh, from, from our session today to make this just, um, just as good as it can be uh, up on the, on the ARC Lessons site. So you don't have to write down all this stuff. It will be up there. But briefly, as you know, spatial data, geospatial data is sometimes called uh, a little bit of a redundant term, right, because they both mean geographically referenced data that you can ingest into a GIS to solve uh, problems. And as you know from being interested in education is that many of those data sets are uh, quite useful for education. I used to work at the USGS, for example, and at the Census Bureau, and there are legions of people at those agencies and others that do nothing but compile spatial data. So the good news for you is that you don't have to generate base spatial data for your area of, of study or your area of interest. Sure, you might be, you might have a, a gap. Let's say you're looking at the wetland down the street from your community. You might have to digitize, you might have to collect or have your 4-H students, for example, collect data in that wetland. But the aerial photo, the soil data, at least at the county level, uh, and some other base layers that that wetland would fall in are already available. So you don't have to recreate the wheel. So th this slide sort of summarizes why you might consider using some of these uh, base spatial data sets. Speaking of international, uh, we might have another session on that because the, the, while the situation has improved and just two weeks ago uh, a number of us uh, learned about a wonderful data resource, for example, in Kenya with over 100 layers in it, uh, it just depends on the place that you're interested in. It's a, it's a sort of a spotty coverage. Most places have some base spatial data, but oftentimes you have to pay for it. And I think one of our goals here is to seek out low-cost or free base spatial data that's of good quality. And many people around the world are using base spatial data not just for education but for many other uh, areas of interest in many other fields. So where we were uh, years ago, right, you had national mapping agencies and state and county uh, assessors departments, planning departments and others that would each maintain their own set of maps. And where we've come is, of course, having the ability to go to base information, spatial information, and being able to click on things and access other sorts of information on that particular area of land. So really, that's the value of GIS, right, folks, is that you've got the ability to not just look at, let's say, your typical topo map that had contour lines and vegetation and a couple of other layers, but, oh, by the way, I want some soil data, and now I want some shaded relief, and I want to know the quality of the water in those rivers that I see in the map. That's what we've got here with these wonderfully rich spatial data sets. So it's integrating the biological information, the geological information, the hydrologic information. Some of this data is not in map form. For example, the real-time stream flow information. But that's data that you can connect to a map with things like a table joint operation. And the geographic information. What we want, what we all want, is for this if access to be interactive, right? We want to be able to select a certain, let's say, gauging station on a river and pop up the hydrograph, the water flow information for that particular gauging station. We want to be able to click on a certain aerial photo or satellite image and see what it looks like on the ground at that particular spot. 
and we want to be able to access the tabular information for that same location. So a couple of trends in spatial data access, as you are well aware from being in this field, we have increasing volume of data, we have increasing coverage, we also have increasing detail at finer and finer scales. Increasingly the data is developed via partnerships. Uh, there are organizations getting involved with spatial data uh, serving that previously were never involved with that. For example, a week ago I posted a note to a couple of listservs about National Geographic having a data portal, so you band an area on a map and you want that high resolution rescanned USGS topo that National Geographic has scanned for their topo product and you can get it. You get a box on your screen and it was something like $11 for a couple of square kilometers but for really high resolution data. So um, increasingly via partnerships is the point of that and increasingly via user defined geographic areas. So in the past you were sort of confined to things like the seven and a half minute topographic quadrangle grid. Nowadays, more and more, you're able to band an area on a map and say, I want this layer and I don't want that layer, but I do want this layer and I don't want that layer, but I want this layer. So I want three layers and I don't want two layers on a user-defined map. And then the delivery of these spatial data sets, first, you know, you had to get it way back when, 15 years ago, via some sort of media, even 10 years ago via media, uh, some sort of a tape or disk then you could access these via FTP and nowadays, uh, sure, you can still get those, both of the above, but you can also get uh, delivery via map-based uh, interfaces. So it's actually quite an exciting time for accessing spatial data. Well, let's talk about some of the main data portals. The Geospatial One Stop is an effort by the federal government. Uh, many federal agencies involved, Census Bureau, FEMA, USGS, for example, uh, to host data. The Geospatial One Stop is a, a, a useful portal, but as the name implies, uh, well actually as the name doesn't imply, it's not really a one stop. It's not a one stop shop. Uh, it's, it's definitely a useful one, but it's not the only data portal out there. Uh, nevertheless, you can get things. One of my favorite things to grab over on the Geospatial One Stop is historical imagery for Katrina. Katrina was sort of a um, a showcase for the geospatial one stop. So you can get historical topo maps for New Orleans looking at the settlement pattern. What a wonderful resource that is uh, for education. Another one, another main data portal is called the National Map. And this was the attempt of, by the USGS and a couple of other agencies to really start putting the data for the topographic map series online. So if you go to nationalmap.gov, this is one of those user-defined sort of map interfaces where you can band an area and say, eh, I want the aerial photos and I want the hydro data. And this is a good example of what these, what these map portals are increasingly looking like. You've got some sort of toolbox somewhere on the screen. You have map layers somewhere and then you have your map itself. We won't get into this in great detail today, but I think you're aware that the old model, the tried and true model that was in existence for years and years, uh, at least from 1990 onward, uh, has been sort of shaken from its foundations in the last few years. This old model that I'm talking about is actually going out to a site, grabbing the data, and putting it on your local computer. Nowadays, though, as you're probably aware, you don't have to grab every single data set that you see and load it locally, right folks? You can use services, for example, in ArcGIS, you can say, I don't want to add this layer from my local hard drive. On the contrary, I want to add it from nationalatlas.gov or maybe the state of New York GIS data service. So that data does not have to reside locally anymore. And that's, I think, uh, another topic for another time, but uh, just recognize that you've got lots of different choices these days. Coming back to one of the main data portals, uh, National Atlas. This is sort of a, a two-pronged uh, uh, resource. Number one, you can use the map maker resource on the National Atlas to make your own online map. So it's really a web-based GIS educational tool but you can also download every single layer from the National Atlas into your local system. So you've got the best of both worlds. Now, 
you may ask, if I can download or if I can make a map online, why would I want to download it to my local drive and use it in my local desktop GIS? Ah, very good question. The reason why you still might want to download things is because, as you know, with, with web-based GIS, it's sort of like bumper cars, right? You can only go so far and then you're on the edge of the track. Uh, with de desktop GIS, you have the capability of going deeper, right? You can ask deeper, more analytical questions. Terra Server is uh, a tried and true resource, about 10 years old now this summer. And it is a resource for just U.S., but it's a place where you can get topo maps and aerial photos for mul multiple different years. For example, one of my favorite places, Black Canyon National Park, you can get the uh, digital ortho photo quad and the digital raster graphic uh, from that Terra Server site. The neat thing about it is that they're geo-referenced and ready to go inside ArcGIS. There's also a Terra Server tool that uh, uh, someone at ESRI wrote, Thomas NG. He wrote a tool where if you've got an area on your ArcMap map document, say, it will automatically download from Terra Server the topographic maps and the aerial photos for that area that you're under, that's under study. So you don't have to go out to Terra Server and grab little it's, itsy bitsy pieces of these little uh, 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 data sets. You can actually access the Terra Server tool and it will automatically know exactly what you want. So very handy. There are a number of portals that have backup FTP sites. And I don't know about you, but every once in a while, uh, you're in a place, you're teaching in a place where you just don't have good bandwidth to be able to grab data and pull it down from you know, a, a, a mapping portal. So you, you want to have an FTP capability, and that's what several of these uh, allow. Okay, so selected base spatial data. What, what data sets are out there uh, that I could use inside a GIS? And here are just a few of those uh, right here. Uh, topographic maps, uh, yes. Thematic maps, uh, it's sort of an if, iffy situation with thematic maps. There are many good paper, coal, earthquake, geologic, etc. maps that have been digitized and scanned uh, into a GIS compatible format. And increasingly, as you are probably well aware, these maps are now made with GIS in the first place. So of course they're going to have the spatial data. Now, as you heard me say earlier, yes, you can band an area on many map services and grab your specific study area. But in other cases, you're still confined to the USGS seven and a half minute grid. So you may ask, well, how can I find out what the topo name is for my study area and therefore what map I'll need. Well, my favorite place is this uh, USGS business partner called MapLink. They went ahead and scanned all the USGS topo maps. Uh, another resource, since we're talking about that, is inside ArcGIS, you've got the seven and a half minute topo quad grid. If you drill down inside your program files, ArcGIS, there's a reference systems uh, folder, and inside there, one of the layers that you can load inside ArcMap is the 24K grid. So another uh, product is called the Digital Raster Graphics, or DRG. And one of the reasons why I'm going through a couple of these folks is because it's sort of like alphabet soup otherwise. Uh, you know, you get into this digital raster, what? What was that again? So it is kind of a, a, a lingo-laden uh, scenario, sorry about that, but that's just the way it is and that's one of the reasons why we like to help folks sort through the alphabet soup. But these digital raster graphics, for example, another one of my favorite places, the University of Northern Iowa. Awesome. Caught there one time and it's a great place. Anyway, this is what one of these DRGs looks like, just like you would see in a topographic map, but only in digital form, usually a TIFF file, sometimes a GeoTIFF. Digital line graphs are the oldest kind of spatial data out there. They've been produced since, oh folks, the height of the disco era. 1979 is when these things started. 
digital line graphs. They are, as the name implies, they are vector data sets of uh, topographic map features. Hydro, contour lines, boundaries, that sort of thing. Digital elevation models, they are produced by scanning the topographic maps and they are a grid. So they're raster data and from that raster data you can make things like you see here on the screen. You can make shaded reliefs. You can make slope maps. You can make aspect maps all inside ArcGIS with the spatial analyst extension. So you do need spatial analysts to be able to do anything with these DRGs or DMs, sorry. Alphabet soup, just like I said. Aerial photos, there are lots of aerial photos. They go by it way back to, oh, there's some from the 1920s. And uh, chances are old aerial photos you're going to have to scan in yourself. There are some organizations that have scanned in aerials and I have a, a document that I can send you about some of the resources for historical aerials. But increasingly some of these agencies like the Illinois Department of Natural Resources I stumbled across last fall, uh, they've got old aerials of uh, much of the state uh, going back to the 1930s. So what a resource to be able to use those inside a GIS to have students looking at how their neighborhood, for example, has changed over time. Digital ortho photo quads, or DOQs you might hear uh, as the acronym, are, as the name implies, they're scanned but also rectified aerial photos. So they take in to account all of the tilt and pitch that an airplane would have when it's flying these aerials and correct for things like that as well as correcting for things like uh, relief of the land. Satellite imagery, there used to be that uh, not many people could use satellite imagery because it just was big data sets and now with the advent of big storage uh, devices, big hard disks on machines, that's really not a, too much of an issue anymore these days which is good news for you and I, right, using this in an educational context. And there are lots of different kinds of satellite images out there these days, not just Landsat. One of my favorite places to get the satellite imagery is from the University of Maryland Global Land Cover Facility, or GLCF. These folks have done a wonderful job with Landsat and other uh, satellite imagery. If you want yesterday's satellite image, though, or a specific date, sorry, you're out of luck as far as getting that for free. You've got to pay for that. But if you don't mind a satellite image of your, of your community from two years ago or five years ago, then GLCF is your, is your friend, okay? Um, and there are many examples of state data sets um, and data resources that actually host some of these satellite imagery uh, data sets. One of them is called America View, and they're spin-offs like Ohio View and some of these others, Pennsylvania Spatial Data Access, are wonderful resources, folks, to uh, access. And as I mentioned, there's other imagery out there. There's MODIS, there's Aster. There's not just um, color and black and white in the visible spectral band anymore. You've got radar imagery, you've got near infrared, so it's, a, it's a, again, a, a, good, a good time to, to be alive as far as spatial data access. Land cover data, let's talk about that briefly because a lot of educators want to use land cover data. This is a program that started uh, as the land use land cover program in the 1970s and then moved over to the national land cover data. Uh, the reason why I bring this up is because you've got a, a three time period window here where you can start looking at changes in your community. Most of the land cover data comes over as, as raster data, so it's little pixels of discrete raster data. In other words, a, a 71 will be grassland, a 11 will be open water, that type of thing. So it's, it's a whole number integer raster data. And you can get this in a variety of ways. Again, this whole presentation will be, will be online. So I don't feel the need to go into every one of these sites. Just to give you an overview, uh, National Hydro Data Set is a comprehensive set of uh, digital spatial data for watersheds. And it's completed up to the 1 to 24,000 scale for the whole U.S. and at uh, 1 to 10,000 scale for some of the U.S. But 
really that one to twenty four thousand scale is really quite uh, quite detailed. Uh, the best place to get it is from nhd.usgs.gov. Again, comes over by a watershed. And the national elevation data is uh, an attempt to sort of edge match all of these digital elevation models into one seamless uh, elevation data set. Okay. This acronym I've got up here, SRTM, that is the global Federal Radar Topography Mission elevation data. Uh, again, flown by the space shuttle. Uh, a couple of us had the pleasure of meeting the main astronaut who actually went up uh, a month ago on the space shuttle again, Dom Gorey, and uh, he's the one who flew the SRTM. Oh, man. It is pretty darn cool. Anyway, so there are some statewide and regional GIS data distributors too. Um, again, I won't go through all these, but you'll have all these things at your fingertips. And just to sort of sum up here, some internet resources. Uh, a couple of things I didn't mention, so I put them right here. Tiger data, uh, topologically integrated geographic encoding and referencing, but it's basically the block groups, the census tracts with the spatial data and the demographic information all bundled into one uh, harmonious data set. Okay, and ESRI uh, has that uh, up on that site right there. Um, again, ready to go. Yeah, you can get it from census.gov, but you'll go through more steps. And I think one of the things I wanted to stress here in our workshop today is minimize the data preparation that you're doing and maximize the analysis that you're doing or the students are doing, right? You don't want to spend much time downloading this stuff. You want to quickly get to the analysis stage. The soils data from USDA is a wonderful resource as well. Okay? So that's uh, uh, just a summary of some of the main spatial data sets. But now what I'd like to do is to access a lesson here, and I'll pause while that comes up on your screen. Do you guys see this uh, analyzing coastal hurricane hazards in Texas? Yes. yes. Okay. Is everybody having fun? Yes. Okay. I, I can't think of anything better than talking about spatial data on a Wednesday afternoon. So thanks for being here. Okay. Okay. Here is a lesson that uh, uh, I created to. Uh, do, to accomplish a couple of things, I really wanted students to be able to dig into uh, these spatial resources, but not just in a random fashion. I wanted them to be able to get gain skills doing the following things. Uh, in this activity, what they'll do is they'll download and use 14 state-level public domain spa spatial data sets from six different agencies to assess hurricane hazards in Texas. And here's one of the final uh, maps that they produce. So the skills involved are uh, really threefold, downloading and formatting data from a variety of data sources uh, for use in GIS, including the Texas Hazard Mitigation Package, the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality, the, the no National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, right, Texas General Land Office, Texas Natural Resources Information System, and also USRI Canada. And number two, examining metadata associated with public domain data, right? That's one of the things that always runs through what we're trying to get across to the students, right, folks? Know where your data came from. Is it of sufficient quality for you to use? What are the limitations of the data, right? Just because it's a map and just because some agency hosted it doesn't mean it's perfect, right, folks? Right. And then number three, solving natural hazards problems based on spatial analysis, specifically analysis of hurricane hazards and the at-risk populations, the at-risk reservoirs, the toxic waste sites, and the oil and natural gas infrastructure. I mean, it's a real-world problem, right, folks? Uh, just think of the disruption in oil and gas during Hurricane Katrina. So this is, again, trying to get the students to grapple with a really uh, relevant, timely problem. So what I've constructed here is NOAA, FEMA, and the State of Texas Office of Virgin Emergency Preparedness have formed, formed a joint operations working group to assess hurricane hazards in Texas. They have hired you, yes you, to examine these hazards from a spatial perspective using GIS and prepare a final report that will provide guidance to local, state, and national emergency and agency decision makers. Okay, so the first part of the lesson 
is good data management, right? We're going to practice good data management here. We're going to create a working folder where you're going to store the data. And you're going to have a logical name, right, with no spaces in it. And when you download the data, you're going to be naming it in a logical way. You're not going to call it hurricane1.shape or hurricane1b.shape or hurricane2.shape because you won't know what those data sets mean after a short time. So that's what the first part of the lesson is, is I want the students to dig into not just downloading data saying click, 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 and I haven't learned anything, but actually to I ask them questions about, okay, well, what is this agency? Why do they exist? What, what kinds of data do they have? So let's just take a look at one of these, the Texas General Land Office. Texas General Land Office is one of the oldest data, actually old, one of the oldest government agencies in the state of Texas. Think of the old settlers and how they were dividing up the land uh, for settlement. Well, the General Land Office was the agency that uh, created uh, the boundaries for, okay, you're going to get, you know, this is the 40 acres that's available for, for homesteading type of thing. So, but uh, not only are they an old agency with a lot of really pretty cool history, uh, they are a modern agency as well, hosting a whole mountain load of spatial data. And one of those data sets is right, uh, is, well, actually several of the data sets are going to be used in this um, lesson. So you can see here that the base map data, county boundaries, uh, hydro, et cetera, and you've got some choices here as you have on many spatial data sites. In this case, you've got this E00, hmm, what is that E00? Then you also have a shape file uh, format. Well, Again, like I said before, folks, what your goal is in uh, downloading and accessing these sites, of course, is to minimize the formatting time that you would have to spend. It's a lot easier to grab data nowadays than ever before. That being said, though, a lot of times you do have choices, and you want to go with the, <laughs> the choice that minimizes your downloading and uh, formatting time. So in this case, you want to go with the shape file. The E00s require you to go one more, to have one more step involved on the ArcGIS side because it's an older format. It comes from the Arc, it's an Arc Info export format. So you go with the shape file. But uh, I don't know if you can see the size of the scroll bar. Maybe not. But uh, that all is to say that there are, just on the Texas General Land Office site, I'm looking at about 60 layers just in this site alone. Okay? So back on our lesson, uh, for hydrography, roads, oil and gas leases, populated places in the shoreline, access data from the GIS portal of the Texas General Land Office. So they go out to Texas GLO, and then I ask, what is the GLO, and what is its importance to the geospatial community? So they have to do a little investigating there. And then I have them download the shape files for hydro, place names, roads, shoreline, and the oil and gas leases. Um, then they go out to ESRI Canada and access the Hurricane Rita data. Now, you may ask, well, why does ESRI Canada have the Hurricane Rita data? Isn't there another place I could access Hurricane Rita? Well, sure. But again, the idea is go to a place that, again, is some, a place that you trust, a place that you know is, has quality data. Uh, but also that is not going to require you to go through four or five steps just to manipulate the data to get into the format that you need. And since it's at ESRI Canada, and obviously they're using ESRI software, uh, they have already packaged up uh, data from NOAA and made it into a, a nice, neat shape file that you can access uh, easily for this, this particular lesson. So once they've downloaded the data, they have to unzip it, and then they're going to analyze it. Now we come to the heart of the list. They're going to go into Arc Toolbox first, and they're going to clip out the North Atlantic hurricanes to just the Texas hurricanes. In other words, the hurricanes that cross Texas. As you know, since there's sort of a good news, bad news story with spatial data, right, folks? The good news is that there's a lot of spatial data out there. 
the bad news is that there's so much spatial data, oftentimes you can't see the, the trees because there's this forest, right? So one of the one of the key things, I think one of the key skills is to is to slice through this barrage load of data that you obtain and just get your study area. So that's what I have them do here. Is they clip out all the other hurricanes and they just get to Texas. It's like a whole other country, right folks? Texas. So let me show you what the Texas hurricanes look like here. And I've just zoomed into a little bit of Texas here inside ArcMap now. This is all data that I've downloaded from these spatial data portals. And I'm hoping that you can see the arrows, the blue arrows on there. That comes from the North Atlantic hurricanes just clipped to uh, Texas, uh, the Texas and vicinity hurricanes, okay? So I could zoom out and you'd see a whole lot more, uh, but we're just looking at a tiny piece of the shoreline because another thing I wanted you to look at is the subleases. See these little polygons that I've got? I've actually got them uh, symbolized in the way that a 15-year-old a would symbolize them. Hey, I see a poison overlay uh, uh, symbology. Let's, let's label them poison overlay. That's almost the first thing that they always choose. Anyway, it's a nice, uh, it's a nice orange stripe, so I like to use it for the, for the subleases, although on your screen you might see it as a slightly different color. Anyway, but look at the, the level of detail that you get there in the subleases. This is amazing, amazing stuff. Um, it's, again, it's, it's, I'm looking at the I part of GIS down here below. I'm looking at the table. It's got to whether they're producing oil and gas fields, if they're, if they're active, if they've shut down. You've got quite a bit of data here. Okay. So I'm going to turn off that uh, particular layer. I'm going to turn on the population data. Um, I'm also going to zoom into a different thing that um, we got from TINRIS, the Texas Natural Resources Information uh, System, which is one of the things in this lesson. So I'm going to turn off a couple of other layers here for the moment. And now I'm zooming into Galveston Island because one of the things I want folks to look at here, and let's turn on the, aerial photo, um, I want folks to realize that what's the problem with Galveston? It's a barrier island, right? And barrier islands are vulnerable to storm surges, as you know, the most devastating hurricane still is the September 1900 hurricane that hit a number of places, but the main place that it caused the uh, fatalities and injuries and property damage was Galveston Island. And so I want folks to actually zoom in on Galveston with an aerial photo that they, again, I'm not giving them anything in the MXD at the start of the lesson. They download all these layers. Now, as an aside, since we're, we're oftentimes interested in most effective teaching methods when we use GIS, uh, you've got choices here, right, folks? If you don't want to have uh, the 4-H students or any other students downloading data in, a, in this lesson, there's nothing to prevent you from downloading all that stuff at the beginning of a lesson yourself and then just handing it to the students saying, okay, here's all the data and here's where it came from and now you do the analysis. There's nothing wrong with that, folks. It just depends on your instructional goals. Do you want to have them, uh, do you want to equip them with skills to download data or do you just want to concentrate on the analysis? I think they're both valid and this lesson allows you to do both things, but you don't have to do both things. Okay? So, I'm going to turn on the Popo map. Again, this is something that came over from the uh, Texas Natural Resources Information System or TINRIS. And I want the students to dig into, I'm not sure if you'll be able to see this with the screen resolution the way it is. I had to sort of bump down the resolution a little bit. But as in many other places, 
uh, what you've got here is a situation where you've got this sort of natural levee, and on top of that, you see the seawall here in the southern part of the image? I have some questions in the lesson about, okay, what's the height of the seawall? Here's a benchmark that's 14 feet above sea level. And I always have to, I, I make the students give me the units. It drives me crazy when they just say 14. Well, is it 14 meters or 14 feet? Or is it 14 kilometers? I mean, give me the units so that they can see uh, that it's not very high, for one thing, in this case. Also, as you go back from the seawall and from that sort of natural levee right by the coast, you're getting into some of the back bayous here, many of which have been filled in because of urban development. But you can see this, this particular uh, uh, elevation and this particular elevation, this is five, five feet, this is three feet, this is six feet. So one of the, one of the questions in the lesson was, okay, so you'd be able to stand on the seawall during a storm surge of ten feet, but behind you, and as you know, this is exactly what happened in New Orleans or Katrina, behind you everything's going to be underwater because the elevation is less. And in fact, you can go to some of these places and they get really close to sea level itself. Okay? So the lesson is a statewide lesson, but there's also some local studies that have to do uh, here. So let's zoom out to a little bit uh, uh, in this question so far, comments? Okay, be sure to jot those down if you don't want to say them out loud. <laughs> jot those to Esther. The last part of the lesson, um, and here is the Rita track, the last part of the lesson asks the students to assess airports, reservoirs that could be breached, access out of hurricane uh, impacted areas, and this, this is the kind of data that they're looking at. Again, it's all stuff, it's all data that they've downloaded. Let me skip in the lesson toward the end here. So as in other lessons, what we try to do, and I know you try to do this as well, is let's not just click, 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 and here's my results, but what is this really saying? So here, number 46, what roads could you most effectively use to evacuate people from the area surrounding these three at-risk reservoirs? So this is where after they zoomed into three of the largest reservoirs, they've had to do a sort in the table to find out what the three largest ones are inside the lowest elevation zone near the coast, okay? Then there's a GIS skill right after that, number 47, create a layout. You paste it into this lesson. And any other information that you think will communicate the intent of your map. So in other words, I want them to include a legend, I want them to include the name, a scale, that sort of thing. Also, uh, kind of touching on what we talked about earlier, they're going to get a lot of spatial data from various agencies. And they are actually going to download two different kinds of shorelines. One. Uh, called Hydro 2M, and the other one is called Texas Shoreline. Um, so one came from a state agency, one came from NOAA, and I have them examine the differences between the two shorelines. One of that, obviously, it's pretty obvious, that it's a higher resolution shoreline. The other is a lower resolution shoreline. So I have the students look at how is the shoreline portrayed differently between these layers. And is there anything that you can determine by examining the, ah, the metadata in our catalog or by accessing the original websites for these agencies where you obtain the data that would indicate the reason for the differences? And the agency will say, oh, we collected the data at 1 to 2 million scale or we collected the data at 1 to 24,000 scale, etc. So I want them to see that not all shorelines are created equal. And so depending on your application, if you buffered a coarse resolution shoreline, right, you're going to get a different area of, that is within, let's say, 100 kilometers of that shoreline than if you had buffered the detailed shoreline, right? Which coastline do you believe would be more accurate to use for GIS um, analysis in this case? Okay. 
Then they, they use select by location, so now they're getting into some more analysis, to select the cities that are within 50 kilometers of the Gulf of Mexico, applying to the, a buffer to the Gulf of Mexico as follows. So I have a little screenshot there where they, although it's fairly intuitive nowadays, but occasionally I still include these screenshots uh, just to sort of anchor them, oh, okay, I'm doing it right. Then how many cities are within 50 kilometers of a coastline? Then they're going to select by location to answer the following question. Okay, how many cities are within 50 kilometers of the shore of the coastline and in the most severe elevation risk zone? What are the top three cities in population that meets both of these criteria? List them below. Then they look at some county level data and they look at the fact that not all counties are created equal. And then finally they they go down and they, they add the Superfund data and then figure out how many Superfund sites are in the lowest elevation zone. And then they look at um, airports, the oil and gas lease data, and finally, toward the end, um, okay, what are legitimate criteria and procedures that you could use to assess the risks of facilities, drilling platforms, pipelines, and associated shipping? associated with these oil and gas leases that might occur from a hurricane. So, you know, in other words, well, how would you figure out what the risk is? I want, I want people to go through these lessons and realize that, okay, in this case, it's what, 10 or a dozen or so layers that they're looking at, but this isn't every single layer that they could look at, right? At some point, and I know you realize this as instructors, you have to simplify what you're doing in order for it to be an effective educational lesson. If they were, if they were really working for FEMA, yes, they would, they would download more layers, right? They would dig into this in a more rigorous way. But you've got to simplify it at some point, otherwise your lesson is going to be, you know, 50 pages long, right folks? So I have them think about, in this very last question, what other data might you like to have to even more fully assess hurricane risk? And then a couple of reflection questions about summarize in a few sentences what you've learned about coastal hurricane risks in this lesson, and also summarize in a few sentences what you've learned about GIS and spatial data in this lesson. And also have them reflect on which public domain data portal did you find to be the most easy to, to navigate, right? These are not all created equal. Some are a little bit easier than others to navigate. Now I on purpose direct them to things that were fairly easy to use. I didn't have them go to the most cryptic because I didn't want them to get bogged down into trying to navigate these things. So that is uh, an, an example, and there are others that we're posting on ARC lessons of, okay, how do I use the library that I've got up there on the internet to grab spatial data, to bring it into my ArcGIS environment, and then that's not the end of the story, right? So what, that I can download data? Well, the most important part is the second part. Now, what are you going to do with it? How can you analyze it? What can you, what can you say about that particular phenomenon, whether it's coastal hazards in this case, or um, looking at population, urban sprawl, or biodiversity loss, or energy needs, or whatever. So I'm hoping that gives you an idea anyway, even though we didn't go through the whole lesson of what kinds of things that they can do, what kinds of data that they can access. And again, remember, this is just a drop in the bucket, folks. This is just hurricane impacts in Texas. And just in that one example, you've got this plethora of resources to bear on that particular problem. Okay, sorry so wordy, but um, we do have a few minutes now to uh, take questions, comments. Would love to hear from you all. I just wanted to say I think I'm, uh, I'm very impressed with how you create your lessons and I'm wondering how do you start even beginning to uh, formulate how you're going to approach a lesson like this from the very beginning. I mean, you have all, like, 65 or so questions, um, but I'm just wondering how your thought process is starting from A to the end. Well, I'd love to hear from others, too. Um, in response, I would say usually in, in a workshop, a GIS workshop, and I referred to this earlier, 
when folks start realizing that, wow, look what's out there, they want to be, oh, I want to download it all, right? I want to get to it all. Well, and so I'm trying to practice what I preach in these workshops by, okay, well, what do you want to teach about? And then the data will follow, right? That doesn't mean that if you're going to teach about, uh, oh, gosh, Okay, here's another example. There was a massive windstorm in north central Colorado about eight years ago. It was the Route County blowdown. And there is a limited number of uh, uh, data sets that actually detail that. So, you know, for certain things that you want to teach, maybe, maybe the, the resources are just not quite there, and so you're going to have to dig a little deeper. Sometimes for a certain lesson, you might come into a stumbling block. And then as an instructor, you're going to have to decide, okay, am I going to spend three hours researching how to get data for this particular lesson that I want to teach? Or maybe I've got another lesson that is equivalently uh, valuable and I've got a lot more data. I've got a lot, and I've got easier uh, data portals. So, you know, it's, it's a difficult uh, thing to, to answer, but I, I de definitely would advise starting with, okay, what do you want to teach, and then find out what's out there, starting with some of these main data portals that I identified in the slides, and then digging into, you know, state, local, uh, international, et cetera, and then, okay, what can you obtain for this area? Um, and, and also, think about this you might not have to create it all from scratch. There might be someone who's addressing that same problem that might have already assembled the data necessary for their particular research project, in which case, hey, you could just contact that researcher and say, hey, I'm in education. Is there any way I can access some of your data? And oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes if they're publicly available public domain data sources that that researcher has gathered, they are sometimes willing to give that over to you. So. Uh, it's kind of a long-winded answer. Well, this is Diana in Hawaii. Can you hear me? Hey, yeah, we can hear you loud and clear across the, across the pond. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much for this opportunity. The timing is just perfect. I really needed this overview and reinforcement of this. and. I have a little list here of things I need to teach myself to do, or, or perhaps maybe it will be covered in a future webinar, but I, I just thought maybe it might be helpful to share them with you. I, I am not really familiar with how to clip shapefiles, um, but I think that sounds like something really valuable, the clipping, and then the, the examining the metadata in art catalog. Those are just on my own personal. Um, need to learn uh, list. Hey, no worries. We all have this list. I got a, <laughs> I got a big list too of things that I need to beef up on. But in brief, um, about the clipping, the, I guess you could kind of think of it as two categories. One, if you've got a polygon like I had for Texas, and I've got another data set that was all the hurricanes from the North Atlantic, I could say I could I, first I selected Texas, and then I just did a select by location, and I said select from the hurricanes all of the hurricanes that intersected this polygon, and this polygon happened to be the one I had selected, which is basically the Texas State Outline. The other way to do it is to actually use the clipping tool inside our, our toolbox. Uh -huh. That is if you've got, let's say you've got a, a piece of land cover data for Hawaii, and you only want them to look at, like, Kihei. And and so you've got a, a little polygon or something like that that is the outline of Kihei, and you've got a land cover data set that is the whole island of Maui. You can use the clipping tool uh, to clip out everything except Kihei. So there's a couple of things that, uh, that's just two, two ways to do it. Okay. Uh, the second thing is up on our catalog, uh, that's, that's pretty easy. Uh, you can just click on the metadata tab for a particular data set. So just navigate, you know, through the directory structure and then you can you can view the data, you can look at the tables. But one of the things, uh, you know, coming back to your question is that you can click on the metadata tab. Now, that all being said, that is only if an agency creating the data has populated 
the metadata for the, for the data set. Now, federal agencies are required to populate that, and, and state agencies, most of them are required to do so also. They, they follow the federal metadata standards. But you might get some data at some point that has no metadata. In fact, a lot of data that I've sort of dragged with me over the years, uh, you know, some of the data sets, I can't remember where I got them from, <laughs> and they have no metadata because they were, they're actually sort of old that were created before metadata standards were in place. So, you know, you, you might click on a metadata tab and there won't be anything there. So that's the reason. There's just the person who created it never populated that, uh, those fields. So. Okay, but you said or you can go to the source where, if you do know the source where the data came mm -hmm. from, there yeah. should be there should be plenty of information there on the. Uh, on the there way. should be, but again, you're going to come in. <laughs> I'm sure you're going to encounter um, at some point if, if, in the future something that's not documented. But then sometimes it, it sounds so 20th century, but sometimes a phone call to that organization saying, hey, you know, where did you get this? I'm, I'm really interested in using it, but I need a little more data. Um, and, you know, it's just a matter of jotting down what they say or having them send you a file that they might have. Okay. Thank you. Oh, we've only got one more minute, so one more question. Dr. Kersky, this is Jackie Stanton from North Dakota. Jackie from North Dakota. Yes. Cool. Thank you so much. This was wonderful. I do have a question. Terra server tool. I can't get it to work. Any suggestions? I have contacted the originator. Yep. And yep. Just not, I'm not having any luck. It's, it's, that tool is tied to the .NET framework, so there's a whole lot of Microsoft stuff that kind of gets in the way sometimes. Okay. Are you actually able to see it inside your ArcMap session? No. You can't even see the tool? No. Okay, and you ran the, the install on it and everything like that? Yes. Does it give you an error? You know, it, I have to say, I tried this a couple of weeks ago. I can't remember anymore. Okay. <laughs> My memory, oh boy. <laughs> okay, let's uh, let's talk uh, offline about that. Okay. Uh, it it's yeah it's it depends on you know might depend on what service pack you're running. Um, yeah, we'll we'll have to chat about that okay. uh, I, offline. I can, I'll you'll really like it. I I, I hope you're gonna yeah. Let's pursue it because once you get it that once you get that to work, you're gonna love it. Okay, thank you. But thank you for today. This is absolutely what I needed. Perfect. Hey, thank you all. Thank you. You are the thank hero you. out there. You people rock. Keep up the good work. So do you. <laughs> <laughs> bye bye. Bye. Thank you much. And uh, you know where to find Esther and I, right? You know our email addresses and all that good stuff. So feel free to contact us at any time and let us know how we can help. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.